This is Ed Driscoll for PJMedia.com, and we're talking today with Amity Schlaes, the author of the best-selling 2007 book, The Forgotten Man, a 21st century look back at the Great Depression that, in retrospect, was a brilliantly timed foreshadowing of our current Great Recession. And we're also talking with Paul Ravoche, who is the artist who drew up the latest edition of The Forgotten Man, a graphic novel edition. It's published by Harper Perennial and debuted on May 27th. And Amity and Paul, thanks for stopping by today. Well, thanks for having us. Thank you. First of all, I want to tell you both that the graphic novel version of The Forgotten Man looks terrific. How did it come to be? I guess, Amity, you could uh, you could feel part of that. I mean, for me, it was uh, I got a phone call from Chuck Dixon, who was involved in the earlier part of the process, and, and uh, he and I knew each other. And Amity was hunting for an artist. I guess that's part of the tale Amity could relate. But I had the good fortune of being chosen by Amity to be the illustrator for the project. Well, we just wanted to find a way to get The Forgotten Man to more people. We notice uh, kids don't read as much, parents don't read as much, uh, and we like the playfulness of the graphic novel. Uh, You know, history isn't about someone telling you how it was. It's about you figuring it out through your own research, even for a reader of a regular book. So we decided to offer up the 30s, the Forgotten Man 30s, uh, in a book uh, and let the reader decide in this new uh, kind of fun format. Uh, Speaking to Paul, Paul's uh, extremely gifted at depicting history, and he's also extremely solid. Each page is a beauty when he does it. So that combo is key. When there's a historical scene, you know, we, we looked it up and found out what that scene was like. And then, you know, what uh, what do we need? Uh, and we drew it. And Paul uh, had the great patience to work through that process. Well, who is the intended audience for the book? A lot of people who ask about Forgotten Man but won't read a 500-page book. Uh, people who are uh, parents and kids who maybe think they're not getting all of history in American schools. Um, maybe uh, we've had a lot of homeschool interest in the book. Um, people who really want to know more about The Forgotten Man, this idea uh, and this record from the 30s, and maybe approach it in a new way, um, not just to a 500-page history book. The Forgotten Man idea, I should mention, um, for those who may be new to it, and we do have some new readers already um, on the Internet, there was uh, Roosevelt, the great president of the New Deal, spoke of The Forgotten Man at the bottom of the economic pyramid, and he meant the homeless man, for whom we all have pity. But there was a second forgotten man who is the one who pays for the project to help the homeless man. Uh, The man who pays, the man who prays is how he was described. And everyone in the 30s knew this. Whose forgotten man is right, yours or mine? The man who pays the taxes or the man who gets the money? And what if the project to help the man who is poor doesn't work out? What if it's a waste for both? So this idea, over and over again, people have approached us about this forgotten man has been translated into a number of languages, especially in Asia. It wants only Spanish. Uh, I thought, well, let's see if we can do it in pictures, draw the forgotten man. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful gateway, too, Ed, because, um, you know, the comic book market as it is, the graphic novel comic book market, it sort of tends to break into separate, discrete groups. You have superheroes, and you have what could be called the sort of alternative independent press. And we wanted to inhabit that. I think Amity would agree with this. We wanted to inhabit that kind of middle ground, kind of a crossover thing for people who would not normally consider the graphic novel medium. And then maybe for comics readers who are used to reading comics and graphic novels, that portion of that audience that would not necessarily consider this kind of book, they would maybe give it a shot because of the format, because of the fact that it's in a graphic novel. So we're kind of, that's what we're kind of reaching for as, in terms of audience. Amity, I don't really follow the graphic novel industry. Are there left-leaning equivalents to your new project? Oh, absolutely. Um, our book is pretty free market. Forgotten Man is a free market concept. But I, I first noticed Howard Zinn, the progressive historian, had a graphic novel history of the U.S. empire and it was quite successful. Teachers were teaching it in high school. College students were reading it. Um, adults were reading it. They were trying to, you know, um, Paul would use the word gateway. And another artist said, well, comics are a gateway drug to content. Thirties and economics, those are difficult topics. But somehow through comics, you can, you can grapple with them and come up with your own solution. Howard Zinn was succeeding 
um, massively with his cartoon history of the U.S. empire and thought, well, we've got to get in here too and draw our cartoon and you know, let people choose. But, but the medium cannot be ruled um, by, um, by artists and thinkers, wonderful as they are, who only have one point of view, which is yeah. more to the left or progressive. And, you know, Ed, in, inside the book itself, in the portion that you referenced uh, just prior to the interview, with the characters, uh, well, the real people, uh, Rex Tugwell and Stuart Chase, at the Soviet art uh, exhibition, they're having a discussion, which I think we touch on in another part later with the Dorothea Lang image. And it's all about how the, the, the progressives and the left are very good at getting their message out using different medium mediums. So... For example, at the art exhibition, I think they're talking about the paintings, uh, how that's kind of like the vanguard of the, you know, the Soviet ideal, and it gets a lot of attention to the cause. And so that's sort of, even in, within our book, we reference that idea of using different mediums or outlets to kind of trumpet ideas. So I suppose, yeah, this, that's a little bit ironic because our book is, as everybody said, an alternative viewpoint to the left and the Howard Zinn type of approach to things. And Friedrich Hayek published what he called The Road to Serfdom in Cartoons sometime shortly after World War II. Yes, we saw that. Well, that's right. I mean, this is another example of a book. Um, at the time, Hayek was sort of a blitz, a blitz star. Uh, Reader's Digest took this philosopher, Friedrich von Hayek, and uh, excerpted his book, The Road to Serfdom, about how by increments we were going to become socialist. And um, along the way, they also tried a cartoon. But I want to mention, um, Ed, this is a much more ambitious venture than even the cartoon Road to Serfdom. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Paul worked for years on this. And, and just to reference, you know, when we were drawing the Soviets as part of this book, we were, it, the Russia was not in the news. It, well, it mm -hmm. is now. Mm -hmm. And what Paul is depicting is how freedom died in Russia. And the art gallery, actually, the, the, um, uh, the, uh, there's a page where the artists, excuse me, the, the thinkers, the teachers, the future New Dealers who would write the New Deal of the 30s went to an art gallery to look around and see how the Soviets were doing. They said, why should the Russians have all the fun planning everything? We'll go here. And the name, the name of the gallery in the book or the show was the All-Union Printing Trades Exhibition. Uh, it was a specific exhibition. So you'll say, how do we draw that? Well, almost every page in this book was researched. Not everything is accurate because it's a cartoon book, so it has to be short. It has an element of novelization. But when possible, we actually took the exhibits as they happened. Um, the artist, one of them was Lasitsky, right, Paul? Mm -hmm. Yes. And this means something to Paul, by the way, too. I mean, this means something to both of us as people whose families originally came from Eastern Europe, and we know what happened uh, to freedom there. Oh, yeah. It has a very personal element for me. As Amity said, I have family background from Russia. So, um, yeah, it, it, it definitely had a personal meaning and personal commitment in terms of doing this. And just touching on what you referenced there about research, Amity, I mean, if somebody could see a snapshot of my hard drive in working on this on the computer... Uh, because this book was digitally drawn. Um, I mean, it was, it was just literally hundreds and thousands and thousands of research images. So for each page, I would have a folder of research, and you would get into the most arcane kind of little details of, you know, if it's a street in the, in, in the Soviet Union in that time period in the 30s, like what, or the late 20s, you know, what would the lampposts look like? For example, or what would the people, the average people walking by, be wearing? And so we had, to, uh, we did our utmost to get these kind of details correct, or as correct as could be. Um, and you know that made it a little bit maddening, but also fascinating. You learn so much as an illustrator. It's things that you wouldn't normally think about, right? Be if you see them in a film, they're just there. But when you're the illustrator, you actually have to go and find out. Well, what shape is it? What line is it? So quite a journey. Paul, you wrote at your Tumblr page at rocketfiction.tumblr.net, quote, Chuck Dixon did the initial script and then Amity and I took it the rest of the way, working on the final scenes and pages, unquote. Who is Chuck Dixon? Uh, he's a very well-established, uh, I guess you could say mainstream comic writer, and he's known for working on, among many other things, Batman comics. And so I think that... Uh, I suppose you could say he's, I, I, I resist branding, but it's the fact that he 
would be considered a conservative comic book writer. And I think through that, maybe he came onto the project. So he did the um, the early draft of the script. He gave us some ideas that you can see, still see very strongly uh, represented there that were big successes. One of them is, if anyone's interested in trade, a page of Herbert Hoover playing Hoover Ball, <laughs> uh, where Hoover goofs up um, just as Hoover's trade policy goofs up. So imagine this book is like a series of plays about all the folly of the policies in the period. And Chuck has the genius for pulling it all together in a little anecdote. And Paul does too. I will say, you know, print authors learn from people in this medium. This medium is as sophisticated or more as plain print. And it was a learning process for me, but the end was always the same. The government gets too big. It's a problem, even though we all mean well. How do we depict that? and share it with others that good intentions can go awry and that the vanity of planning can have perverse effect. So mm-hmm. it, we ended up doing a lot of humor, Ed, a lot more than in print forgotten men. Yeah, I mean, and that's Amity's touched on a perfect illustration of what I was referring to about arcane details of history. I mean, there's so much, so much um, hidden in the you know, pages of time and, and in the, you know, web, in the, in the interwebs, uh, Hoover Ball, So you come across these wonderful photos of Hoover and some of his staff playing their own version of kind of cross between what would be Amity, like dodgeball and, I don't know, like tennis over a net or something on the lawns of the White House. And you're sort of amazed to see all these incredible things. So wherever we could, we used things like that to make the book visually interesting. It's something I had been rattling on about to Amity a lot. Being a cartoon book, a comic book, it has to have a visual flow. And so wherever we could find something that would work both with the sort of historical narrative, the political narrative, the economic narrative, which all of which were the point of the whole thing existing, wherever I could find something visually that would fit in, we would put that in. So in, in cases like that, it worked really well, I think. Uh, as Amity said, they're, they're, they're playing a game and discussing trade policy. And Hoover really did play with this. It was what we used to call a medicine ball, a ball that's heavy. Yeah. Uh, and and, and uh, what, what Paul drew so beautifully was the vanity of the successful technocrat in the case of Hoover. Amity, along with the new book, your manager also sent me the advertising poster for the new edition of The Forgotten Man. It features Paul's illustration of Dorothea Lange's migrant mother photo from 1936. How is this image chosen for the promotional campaign? Well, you know, the, again, we're talking about telling the story. What are we concerned about? Why are we here? Because we love history, but we also want to be sure it's depicted accurately. And one of the things I learned um, in learning about the Great Depression when I first went to research it as a Wall Street Journal reporter was that it was slightly misrepresented. The the period really wasn't quite the way it seems in the school books. The most famous image is Migrant Mother. You've all seen pictures of her. She has two children around her, maybe a baby at her breast, um, and she's in a kind of uh, tented uh, temporary sitch picture that you know that's very much like Grapes of Wrath. Uh, and it was a pea-picking area on a migrant farm where she was photographed. And this is supposed to capture all that was wrong about the U.S., the agricultural tragedy, the terrible economy, the poverty of good people, and so on. And it did a beautiful photograph by a great artist, Dorothy Lang. But what most of us don't know, even though we studied this and there were whole exhibits about this photo from the 1930s, there was, uh, I know people in Canada, too, where Paul is from who are obsessed with it, is that this photo wasn't taken by Life magazine is objective journalism. It was ordered up by a government department with the specific um, mandate to justify through art what it was spending. Well, that's kind of different, right? You can like the photo. You can see the poverty is real. But, well, gee, if the department wanted more money so it could build homes for ladies like this, maybe they would want them, maybe they wouldn't. Uh, And there's a wonderful story behind the story to Florence, who is the the subject of this photo. She really existed. Um, well, gee, that's different. So what we did in Forgotten Man Graphic was show how the government department, uh, I believe it was the Farm 
Security Administration is basically New Deal, led by Rexford Tugwell and Roy Stryker, who's a genius of graphics, caused such pictures to happen, paid for them, ordered Dorothea Lange to find poverty at certain points, which she did. And uh, so, you know, you have to balance it. The, the government programs sometimes help those very poor people in the case of agriculture, and sometimes they didn't. Also, there's a cost to pride. The, the family of the, of the lady who was the subject of migrant mother was really quite ambivalent about being treated as impoverished, uh, you know, as needy, as begging. And, they, and the whole question of what happens to people when they lose their pride. So since we know every high school teaches the picture, and I do hope you put it on your website, Ed, against what we drew. Oh, absolutely. We wanted to say, look, there's another picture, and here it is, and we actually drew it. And I, I just thought it was the most compelling, you know, it's the icon of the New Deal, so that's why we made the poster off. Yeah, and I, I would add, you know, in terms of, um, that's another example of what I was referencing in terms of kind of finding visual symbols or hooks or ways to show the abstract idea behind the page. So in the three-page sequence where we see the migrant mother picture, we first, in on one page, we see Dorothea Lange in the reality photographing that famous iconic picture. Then we show the picture. And then we show sort of how, it, I guess you could say, it was processed by the government agency. And perhaps a, I think it's fair to say a little bit of the cynicism in the sense that they're kind of discussing how they can use this as a springboard for their programs. So the intention behind that is if someone's looking carefully, they're going to see that as a wider symbol of how government can operate. As Amity said, if they're, they're, you know, this is real harsh poverty for real people, uh, yet they're, they're, it, they're, it's being used in a way by, by the government. Amity and Paul, when you were creating the graphic novel edition of The Forgotten Man, how did you come to choose the way that central characters such as Franklin Roosevelt, Herbert Hoover, and Wendell Wilkie were depicted? Roosevelt does not come off as a great economist um, in the 1930s. The economic policies of our president probably hurt the economy, as indeed did before him Hoover's uh, economic policies. So Roosevelt and Hoover are, are problems, ego problems, basically. In this story, that doesn't say they're not good at other things. Roosevelt was a great steward, a great admiral in World War II. But in this period, but we didn't want to draw them as too evil. We wanted to draw them as human. So Hoover ends up looking kind of egomaniacal, I'd say. Right, mm -hmm. Paul? Yes. In that very middle-aged coach way. Paul drew him kind of like it, the coach you love but you also hate. <laughs> because yeah. he's smart, but he's a little bit of a bully, and he certainly wants his own way all the time, and he'll pout. In the oh, sense of coach, like powerful, athletic kind mm -hmm. of figure or tall, you know, imposing, yes. The guy who's used to winning. We've mm -hmm. all had a professor, a department chair like that who thinks, uh, you know, who's a department head who thinks he's been there a little bit too long and it's always been king or queen, right? Oh, my gosh. That's his Hoover. And then Roosevelt, I, we, we started out with him being dark because this is a cartoon and we do have a superhero. So what is Roosevelt, the opposite of the superhero? But then we felt it was too mean. Um, and we ended it, so we, um, we, in the first pictures, we had, uh, his glasses were blank, so you just had this opacity that you confronted, which is about his unknowability and potentially the threat of this president, who, after all, took 46 out of 48 states, raised taxes like crazy, and tried to crush companies, right? He was a villain to many people, but we thought it was too strong. So we made him more mischievous, the later Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the, who is the superhero? We had, a, that's, um, we had to look long and hard for that. This is a comic book. The superhero was the businessman. People blamed when he was really just sort of trying. And uh, the question is, can business carry recovery? This, this Wendell Wilkie is who it was. And he said, well, I think maybe our business could carry recovery if you don't trash us too much. And he was assaulted in all different ways. His business was by the government. He was in utilities. He had a company called Commonwealth and Southern, and the government created its own competing utilities company, the Tennessee Valley Authority. This is very good to talk about in Tennessee even today. Mm -hmm. And then also, um, they created a, a wiring system that was rural electrification. We've all heard of that. Um, and then third, let's see, they, they tended to prosecute companies like Wilkie's. I forgot, there's a fourth. Um, they also passed a law that made it very hard for private companies to get capital, private utilities companies. And utilities is a very capital-intensive business. So we basically starved 
them. And Wilkie uh, starts out friendly, but gets a little bit angry and busts out of his suit, right? And puts on his cape and tries to rescue the U.S. economy in the election of 1940. So, so that's all there. And I wanted to ask you, several of the pages of the graphic novel were printed in a brown sepia tone. What does that signify? So, as Amity's saying, Wendell Wilkie came in from the wings, as it were, and became a central figure in this version of The Forgotten Man. Because we found as we worked in transposing her book, which is a prose book, no images, you know, to a visual book, um, we, we found a few problems which are inherent not in the book, but just in, that, in the medium, which is that if you f- change time, place, and character too rapidly in a comic book, in, in a medium, you need someone to explain to the reader. Because in a book, he would just say, you know, we're going from Wendell Wilkie's home, but, you know, over, over in Washington, Rexford Tuggle was in his office. You just tell them that. But if you just cut in a comic book and you don't know who those people are or where they are, you can confuse the reader. So what we found is to stitch all this together, we needed a narrator, and it worked quite elegantly and naturally that Wendell Wilkie uh, would be the narrator. And that explains the brown pages, because that, what that means is that we printed, uh, we had a framing sequence where Wendell Wilkie is discussing the events and being the narrator with captions through the book. He's discussing with his girlfriend, Irita Van Doren. And so to demarcate those pages throughout the book, there's, there's sections of two pages here and there that are these Wendell Wilkie narration pages. Um, to demarcate those, we printed them in sepia so that hopefully the reader who reads it sequentially from the beginning, uh, and the people who are confused were people who just opened the book and looked randomly like, oh, some pages are in sepia, what, you know, what's that? And I would say to people at this comic convention who are looking at it in that way, I'd say, well, when you read it, you know, when you really sit down and read it sequentially, you'll see that this is a framing sequence uh, with a kind of voiceover, as it were, if it was a film. And he is the, you know, the wise guide who's narrating all these different things and helping us comprehend, I would say, a very complicated stream of events that Amity shows and takes us through. So is Wilkie more the narrator versus the hero? He's kind both? of both, right? Both. Amity? Okay. It all happened to me. And I, we just wanted someone from the period to tell it. And and also, you know, his it, Wilkie is a fascinating guy. And for this book, I did have the honor to talk to some of his, you know, his relatives. Um, the the Wendell Wilkie, too. Um, other Wilkies over time about him. Wilkie didn't start out as a conservative. He started out as a dynamo, whatever party. Heck, you know, he was going to take this industry, the most exciting industry. Um, it was the internet, right? So he's the Mr. Brin, right? He's the financier. He's figuring this out. Um, he's the financier behind the industry. So let's say he's not the inventor. I, I qualify that. And he didn't care who was in the government. He wanted to be friends with everyone because his company was going to be awesome and it was going to light up the South, which was dark and poor. Um, and all of a sudden he finds, well, um, he thinks he's the David and I don't know, the government is the Goliath. Um, and then he realizes the government thinks he's a monster. The government thinks capital, money is a monster, and that the, it, it itself, his, his, um, his opponent, thinks he's a David, and that opponent was David Lilienthal, the head of the Tennessee Valley Authority. Actually, a literal David. I, I'm sounding a little complicated, but the point is, it was a titanic or biblical battle between the government and the private sector in the nation's most exciting industry. So, Wilkie fought back and fought back, and over time he formed some political views. And then, uh, as we know, he ran for president in 1940 and articulated this. So this whole sort of um, the education of Wendell Wilkie is captured through those pages where he tells the story, you know, I didn't used to have this point of view, but gee, now I do. How did it change? What changed with us in this 10-year Great Depression? Well, I think it all began back, and then he tells the story. Will there be a Kindle version of the graphic novel of The Forgotten Man? We don't know. Okay. We think so, but we don't have it yet. So we, we'd like to punt on that right this sec. Um, the book is a, a quality of paper that's very high. So it's meant to give to your clients, who, you know, for, for the, the conservative clients who want to share the story. Uh, we, 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 I often speak to, to uh, economics classes or businesses, and they say, we'd like the forgotten men and we want to share it with our family, but we're not sure they'll all read the hard 
So this paper, um, and Paul worked hard uh, in the selection of the paper as well, is beautiful. We kind of like it in paper. Well, whatever the format, this is truly a fascinating topic, one that we could easily spend much more time discussing. But we should start wrapping things up. So what are the next plans for this version of The Forgotten Man or The Forgotten Man in general? Get it to teachers. Get it to all those very kind people who've asked me, how can I share this with my kids? How can I share it with my friend who wants a new medium and, you know, might not be a Republican? Well, Wendell Wilkie on some days wasn't a Republican. This is not a party political story. It's just uh, get it to people who are interested in art and conveying art. Um, That's very important to us. It's going to be on the radio a lot and so on and go on television. But mainly what it is is our gift to all those people who are wondering about the economy, wondering about economics. There are a lot of principles in there that some of our friends have articulated in textbooks. Um, They're drawn in pictures now. Um, And also give people something to argue about. But I'm very much looking forward to presenting this at Franklin Roosevelt's birthplace and library in Hyde Park um, up on the Hudson in New York. I've been invited to present it, and I'm sure the people there won't be so happy that that I make uh, Roosevelt not the superhero, but, you know, with, with kids, they don't know anything. As we see, um, for example, now with Russia or vis-a-vis anti-Semitism, it, our younger people don't remember Stalin. They don't remember Gorbachev. They don't remember Hitler. So this is a way to share uh, um, what happened back then, what, back then with them. Yeah, I mean, I, we were joking about gateway drugs. So in a way, this book is a historical stimulant, you know, because there's so many characters, fascinating characters. I learned so much, and having fashioned myself knowledgeable about history, I realized there was just such a deep weave of, you know, people, places, events. So in working on this book, I learned so much. So what we are hoping is that it would be a stimulant to younger people who, you know, if they're reading, as I said, either a superhero graphic novel or a personal biography type of graphic novel, which is limited in scope, they wouldn't find what they would find here, which is an access to historical figures. And hopefully they will be stimulated to say, you know, well, who are all these different people? Let me do more research. Um, And because we touch on a lot of different people. And in the end, we summarize it in the back with a cast of characters, set of pages. We have eight pages which show um, images from the book of the different head cuts of the, the personages and a little biography. We also have a timeline in the back of events. And we, that was kind of added to flesh out and give more material to the whole historical sweep of the book. So, so yeah, we're really hoping that audience grabs on to this. This is Ed Driscoll, and we've been talking today with Amity Schles and Paul Ravoche, who is the artist who drew up the new graphic novel edition of The Forgotten Man. It's published by Harper Perennial, and it's available from Amazon.com in your local bookstore. And Amity and Paul, thanks once again for stopping by pjmedia.com. Thank you so much, Ed. Oh, thank you. 